Well, we did say that we were going to come right back and right back we are. We haven't even changed our shirts. We're in the same session. We're just a few minutes later and we're moving on into this whole new area, this whole new genre. We've looked at coins before and uh, Odon uh, is really the one who we credit for that, though it's Volker Pop who probably did the best work on it. Uh, we've looked at the inscriptions. Lindstad is the one who did the best work on the rock inscriptions. Uh, we've looked at the Qiblas of the of the different mosques, and Dan Gibson is the one that's been credited for that. Now we're moving into paintings and statues and images. Uh, we're calling this images and what was the other word you use? Of, of images and idols. Images and idols. And this is Mel's introduction. This is his, really his contribution to this whole debate. And what is the debate? What is it we're talking about? We're talking about the standard Islamic narrative and how the standard Islamic narrative written in the 9th and 10th century, although we're now coming to a conclusion, maybe it was not written in the 9th and 10th century. It may have been written much, 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 much later, redacted back to the 9th and 10th century because looking at the images and looking at the statues and looking at the murals and looking at the the mosaics on the ground and certainly when we see these palaces that he's already introduced in the eighth century and there is no restraint on their part of showing images they're full of images and not just any type of images gaudy images women bathing men literally looking down at them and reaching out to the to these women women who their bottom torsos are, are shown. So these images are were certainly quite rampant, quite available there in the 8th century. Uh, these continue up into the 9th century. Uh, Mel's going to introduce one from the 10th century, and we saw one in the last episode from 1350. That's, that's the 14th century. So you can see this is quite this is quite normal. This was continuing for quite a few hundred years, and it shuts down this notion that the standard Islamic narrative has, has it correct. Looks like the, either the standard Islamic narrative did not know this, and those who wrote it, Buhari, Muslim, Timid, and the others, weren't aware of this, or that this is something that comes much later, and that the standard Islamic narrative is now introducing that later theological prohibition against iconography. It was a much later prohibition, which has been written into the standard Islamic narrative, who then suggests that this happened at the time of Muhammad. Are you following the sequence? So here comes Mel. He's bringing in a whole new genre. We told that we were going to always use evidence on the ground. In this case, it's not so much on the ground. It's on the walls and it's on statues. Pop, the mosaics on the ground are on the ground, but these are a whole new genre. Mel, you're introducing something we've never really talked about or even thought of. And until you brought it up, you weren't even thinking about this as a whole new genre. But this is yet another genre that shows that the standard Islamic narrative has it incorrect. And that's why we should doubt the standard Islamic narrative, have nothing to do with it. Let's go and see what actually happened. Now, what you're going to do now is you're going to show how this evolved. And that's what we want. We want to see what the paintings tell us, what the statues tell us, what the mosaics tell us, because that's how we're going to know then what really happened. Not what Muslims have told us from the 9th and 10th century and may even be from the 15th and 16th century. What you're going to tell us now is what we can see there in these palaces, on these walls, on these houses, which completely contradict what up to now we always assume was sacrosanct. Over to you. Yeah, uh, let me just open up the PowerPoint. Okay, so um, a picture tells a thousand words, a collection of pictures tells a history. And so my argument really is that if we look at the pictures, um, it's totally contradicting the idea that the Hadiths have that images were prohibited. The fact that we have these images to show you suggests that there were millions of Muslims quite happy with these images over a long period of time, in fact, over a thousand years. Um, if they weren't happy with these images, surely none of these would have got to us today. They would have been destroyed. There would, would have been plenty of opportunities to destroy these images. Now, some Muslims will argue, oh, well, this, these were not um, approved by most Muslims. It was the Turks that allowed these pictures, or it was the Persians and so on. But that's just an excuse. That, that, that's basically saying that they're not real Muslims. But actually, all of these people were accepted as being real Muslims. Um, and most of these 
people who were making these pictures were the, the ones in charge for hundreds of years. So we no. can't really accept that excuse. Well, even the images you showed in the last video, the last episode, they were from the 730s and they were from Syria and Jordan and Jericho. None of those places were Abbasid. And also, this is the 8th century, so this predates. And you can't say it's the Ottoman because they don't come into power until 1299. So we're talking about starting in the 700s, not 1299. So that would throw that notion right out of the water because of the dates. Just look at the dates and you can see this is not that late. Absolutely. So the Islamic leadership didn't seem enthusiastic about banning images. We saw in the previous video that the Umayyad leadership were quite happy to have images and statues of people and animals in their palaces in the 8th century, and some were even of an erotic nature. This was at odds with the claim that there existed at that time Islamic teaching from Hadiths banning the painting of all images of humans and animals regardless of location. So let's look at a selection of images of Muhammad created by Muslims over the centuries. Some of these are taken from an article by Christiane Gruber, another expert in this field, which I recommend that you look up. And others are taken from this blog. And I also want to credit Murad for, for sending me one of the images, which we'll see. And as a foreword from this blog, uh, it was quite common among wealthy Muslims during the Middle Ages to have illustrated copies of the Quran and Hadith that had within their pages pictures of Muhammad. That's quite a, a bombshell there. It was especially common during the early 4th century Ilkhanid dynasty in Persia, but continued to be commonplace during Persia's Timurid dynasty of the 14th to 18th centuries and the Ottoman Empire had many artistic depictions throughout the 14th to 16th centuries. So this was not an isolated um, event. This, as you're going to see, this occurred right through the whole time frame. Now, this one is from Murad. Um, it is one of the earliest. I haven't been able to date it. It's probably the 10th century. It may be earlier. Um, on, on, in the right of the picture, in perhaps you could call it blue or purple, is Muhammad, and the left of the picture is one of his companions, I presume. Um, what do you notice about the picture? Um, well, first of all, you notice that Muhammad is reasonably dark, I would say, Caucasian, not certainly not very pale. Um, the figure to his left um, looks very, um, I would say, perhaps even Jewish, maybe. Um, is there anything that you'd like to say on that? Well, well yeah. what you do notice is you can see his facial image quite easily. He is carrying a sword, so he is the one that is the one the, the head honcho, and he also had looks like he has a a halo, a halo? and uh, a divine, uh, almost divine nature. Yeah, and of course that's straight from the Byzantine uh, influence. Um, they would have depicted their saints with halos. Does um, anybody else in the picture have a halo? I'm just looking. The other ones are just have veils. No one else has a halo but him. So he yeah. is obviously the one that is the 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 saint here, uh, or is in this uh, the saint, it would be sainthood from the Byzantine perspective. In this case, he is given a hallowed perspective, which is stands yeah. puts him above anybody else on that picture. Yeah, Hold on a and uh, the one on the left almost looks Chinese. Uh, it does actually. Yeah, some the. Um, so it's it's interesting. I, I, in the last part, I mentioned how in the early period there was um, they tended to be Byzantine, um, but as you move into from I suppose the tenth onwards, tenth century onwards, there seem to be a switch into more Asian depictions. This is sort of like a hybrid. It's kind of it has aspects which are very Byzantine, and there's aspects which are kind of pushing towards um, a kind of an Asian uh, form of artwork. Well, I'm looking also at the cloud. Look at the cloud above. That is also Asian. Yeah, yeah. It's typically with the curdicues and that. If you look at most of yeah. these art, that is typical. I mean, we're, we're, it's too small for us to unpack it any more than that. But just yeah. on an offset, it would suggest what you were saying in the last episode, that this moved over towards the Asian uh, the, uh, sphere and went over towards that part of the world where these were had no difficulty showing Muhammad in any case form. 
Yeah. And the other thing as well is that because you are now, uh, they're now painting them according to an Asian um, convention or, or, or art style, um, the figures tend to be depicted as Asian because that's just the standard way, the same way as with the Byzantine one. Everyone appears to be Greek. Now everyone appears to be Asian. Now, some people have made maybe too much of this. Um, you know, Murad is of the opinion um, that this means that these leaders were from Central Asia or even further east. I don't think we can draw that conclusion necessarily. I'm not saying he's wrong necessarily, but I would say be careful with that argument because I think it's possible that this is just the convention within that form of art. And I'm sure there are probably viewers who are um, experts in the history of art and maybe if they would like to comment on that, it would be interesting to hear from their perspective. But um, if we move now to the the year 1000 AD, uh, so you, you have here a clear image of Muhammad preaching and he, he's uh, preaching to his followers. Um, if you look at the group of people there in the crowd, you see that they are mixed race. <coughs> you have two darker skinned people on the left hand side and then the rest um, they are more paler skin. Some of them, in fact, I'd say all of them are Asian in appearance, but as you can see, they're following the convention. So that's in the 10th century. Now, we're going to come back to that image in a, in a moment. In the midst of this period, we hear reports that Muslims had images of Muhammad on display. Ralph of Cain reports the destruction of an idol of Muhammad found on the Temple Mount in a book he wrote in 1118 about the first crusade which is from 1096 to 1105 AD. I'm going to read that on the left hand side first of all. Now there's a dispute about this. Um, some people say well maybe he was exaggerating maybe it's propaganda but it's interesting in the context the context of, of all the other images that we can clearly see of Muhammad maybe this isn't completely wrong here. Maybe there's some truth to this. He says, talking about the Temple Mount, he says, a cast image made from silver sat on the highest throne. It was so heavy that six people with strong arms could barely lift it, and ten barely sufficed to carry it. When Tancred saw this, he said, alas, why is this image here which stands on high? What is the purpose of this image with its gems and gold? What is this purpose of this purple cloth? For it was an image of Muhammad entirely covered with gems, purple cloth, and shining with gold. And in this account, he goes on to say that the Crusaders uh, took away this image and destroyed it. Um, I've, I have a mock-up of the scene. Um, a real amateur job. I took an image there and put it in the Dome of the Rock. And that's how I imagined the image according to uh, the report in Ralph of Keynes. Um, but that's an interesting thing. This is the Crusaders report this. Um, and nowadays people dismissed it because, you know, people say, well, there was no images of Muhammad back in those days. Um, so this would never have happened. Um, any thoughts on this, Jay, at this, at this stage? You're, are you saying Ralph of Khan? This is Khan in, in, in France. He's from the French city of Khan. Yes, this, his report in 1050, 1096 to 1105, that period. Yes, he, he wrote the book in 1118. So literally, we're only talking about uh, 13 years after the end of the First Crusade. So, And he says that he based his account on eyewitnesses um, that were there. Um, he, he traveled to Antioch uh, himself personally. Um, so he was familiar with the area. And then uh, he was highly placed in terms of um, being able to speak to eyewitnesses because his family was well connected. Ralph of Cain was actually a priest himself. Uh, so a person of um, high family connections um, and also, I think, someone trustworthy because of the fact that he was a priest, I would I'd imagine. Um, we should give him some... Um, credibility based on you know his background uh, obviously there is a potential that we could say well maybe it's propaganda um, and that this is a, simply a story made up but as I'm going to show you there's an image that I'm going to show you from a later period that seems to bear out his report 
Okay, well, I mean, there's a number of things you can pick up just by that description, and that's why it's good. We do have these descriptions because, listen, who are we in the 21st century to say, suggest that he didn't know what he was talking about? They, he would have no other agenda but that. But here, first and foremost, here you have an image of Muhammad on the Temple Mount, on the Temple Mount, and you're talking about, so you're talking about long after, I mean, this is when the Dome of the Rock was, was, was already in place and is still there. So it's at, on the Dome of the Rock, in the Dome of the Rock, excuse me, and he's wearing purple. Why do you wear purple? That's to show royalty. Yeah. With gems and gold. Why? To show, again, that he is in power. So it's, it stands to reason what he's describing here uh, and why the Crusaders were so upset and why they then took it away or destroyed, destroyed it was because this was in contradistinction of what the Temple Mount was to be. The Temple Mount is where the Holy of Holies is for the Jews, and it's where, uh, where Mount Moriah was, and that's where Abraham supposedly sacrificed uh, Isaac. So you can understand that why the Crusaders were upset with this and why they would uh, get rid of it. But if that is the case, then uh, that, that this image is there, that there was no problem with the statue of Muhammad himself that early, because we're talking about 11, we're talking about 12th century, although this would have, this would have you're saying, probably existed since the 10th century. Yeah, I like I the, the 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 problem is all we have to go on is this report. We don't know when it was placed there. It could have been placed um, like a few decades before there, or it could have been there for hundreds of years. We we simply don't know. But all we can say is if we trust this report, uh, certainly in 1096, they they claim that this was there, um, and so it's interesting. It contradicts in a massive way what the Hadiths are saying is not allowed, you know? And this is, I don't know if we would, like the Dome of the Rock was not a mosque per se, but it's not far off it in terms of status, you know? And I would think this would would fall under the uh, prohibition. If, if we are stick, sticking by the, the, the restricted rule about not having images or, or statues in a place of worship, I think this comes pretty close to that. Well, stop and think. Put that, take that one step further. It is not a mosque. It has never been considered to be a mosque. It's built in an octagonal shape. It's built was actually, as you said in the uh, as we've said earlier, it was actually constructed. The artisans who constructed were Byzantines because the Ar the uh, Arabs at that time uh, for Abd al didn't have that type of expertise to write such a to build such a beautiful structure. So they barbed the Byzantines. They use an octagonal shape, which would have been used. For, and I would suggest, if you're using octagonal shape, that's used, probably used for circumambulation. What's more interesting, if they're circumambulating at that time, and here you have the statue in the middle of it, what does that say about Muhammad? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You start attacking all kinds of problems here, theologically speaking. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if, if this is the 10th century, Muhammad would be well known by this time. He would by this is the Abbasid period. And in the Abbasid period, they would have elevated him to the status of almost the very God that they are denouncing. He is now taking on almost a divine form. I mean, you can unpack and say an awful lot of this, and obviously this became a problem. And someone could probably, if this is true and this statue was there and it was that uh, that large and that and that it caught, was so heavy that uh, six men with strong arms could not barely lift it and 10 barely sufficed to carry it, that's a pretty heavy statue. That's a pretty large Absolutely. statue. Absolutely. Which Absolutely. is at the very center of what this whole dome was was then was then built to be, and this is the Muhammad then that finally took his place in that in that structure. Is this if, the, the beginning of the problem with iconoclasm? Because this was yeah. this was seen as such a an anathema to everything Islam now today believes. Yeah, and actually, if people are finding this hard to accept. Mm -hmm. uh, wait till you hear later from a person called Lloyd de Young, who has found really strong evidence, explicit evidence in the Siras of a growing deification of Muhammad in the text itself. And he can make a very strong argument, which runs parallel to this. But that's for another time. But uh, this is not just an isolated idea. We'll be certainly bringing him on board because I, from what you're telling me, he's had, he's found some amazing discoveries concerning the Sira or the Siras. Many, many, many. Yes. <laughs> Hold on. We're that's... not going to let the cat out of the bag yet because that's yeah. a, a great find. But it would support what we're seeing here. Uh, they needed yeah. to change it. They needed to change the theology. They needed to change the narrative. If you're changing the narrative, this would be one that would, be, what would stand in the way. Yeah. We'll come back to this story a little bit later. Um, but... Um, 
There, there are also widespread references to Muslims having images of Muhammad in the Chanson de Geste, which were songs sung by the Crusaders. One of the most famous one is the Song of Roland, or Roland, which was begun in 1040. Also, let me uh, just say something. You know what Chanson de Geste means in, in, in French? Uh, I, I songs think of it's mockery. Uh, songs of mockery, yeah. yeah. Of jesting. jesting. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. we have in English, jesting. They're yeah. jesting against... Yeah, uh, these are songs of mockery. Yeah, um, so you can see the time frame. This this was written and completed um, in parallel to that other story, but it says in it, and um, sure, there's other there was other examples I could have chosen, but it says he hoists Muhammad, referring, I presume, to an image or an idol, up to the highest tower. There is not a heathen who does not pray to him and adore him. So this is a claim that's in this song of Roland. So this is independent of the other um, story um, around the same time. And uh, so do you remember this um, image that we saw earlier? And have you noticed any difference? Do you remember this? We saw something like this from two centuries before. I don't know if you've noticed, but if you, if you haven't noticed any difference. Well, now, we just... okay. Now you put them side by side. <laughs> it's almost exactly the same image, isn't it? Yeah, but here's the interesting thing. Have you noticed that they have whitewashed <laughs> these images here? You've done. They've taken out the multiracial, made multiracism, and put it into a Arab only depiction. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it, it doesn't take a genius to work out. There's a, a racist undercurrent to this that they had to um, whitewash these people because at that stage. This is two centuries of Islamic progress. We can see that um, attitudes are changing over time. And unfortunately, you know, there's uh, this did not suit at, a, at the later period, probably because of the um, because at that stage there was a lot of slavery and so on and very negative attitudes and so on. But that's it. that's an interesting thing I've noticed. So that's the 13th century there on the right hand side. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is from. The 14th century, so 1307, this is of the young Muhammad, uh, um, is recognized by the prophet, sorry, as a prophet by the Christian monk Bahira. Now, um, personally, I don't know if there's any truth to this Bahira story. Uh, Murad is of the opinion that this appears to be um, in lots of traditions, in Christian traditions and in Muslim traditions, this idea of a, a, a Christian monk called Bahira. So he thinks, well, maybe there's some true to that uh, story. I, I have no opinion as of, of yet. I'm not convinced either way. But Gnosis, again, Muhammad is depicted and uh, we can see that the figures are clearly Asian at this stage. You know, um, here's back a- that image back again. In, in the traditions, in the Hadith, you have the reference to a very young Muhammad and Bahira or others, these monks come to him and in some case, in some case, it changes it to angels come to him and they open up his chest and they take out his heart. They clean his heart and they put it back and close the chest again to show that he is sanctified, that he is different and above all others. This could be a depiction of that event. I, I see an angel who is bending down, coming from heaven, looks down that he is anointing him there. looks like he's anointing him as, as the sanctified one. Yes. Yeah, very much so. And even the fact that the the camels are are bowing down is right. almost, like there's there's a kind of a worship sense of worship sort of implied by those animals kind of bowing down like that you know it's 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 ambiguous let's put it that way but it's well you it have the to... animal kingdom you have the sages and you even have the angels I don't know who that is in the upper right hand it, would that be Allah himself or it'd be one of the prophets who is then also. Yeah giving acknowledgement that he, as a young boy, was to be a great man, that this was acknowledging his ministry and his mission before he was any an adult. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure who's that meant to be there, but yeah, it is it is kind of building him up to be a little bit more than just an ordinary human being, let's put it that way. But I think in parallel to the, the series that are being written, there's a kind of a growing sort of deification of Muhammad over this period. Um, now, from the same book as the previous slide, 1307, we have Muhammad receiving his first revelation from the angel Gabriel. As you can see, 
the features are clearly very Asian, doesn't really fit in with a, an Arabic um, narrative per se. Um, that's just the style, I suppose, of, of the time. Um, here's another one, uh, again from the same book. Uh, Muhammad solves a dispute over lifting the black stone into position, as you can see. All of the figures, particularly if you look at the ones on the right, they're clearly all Asian. Um, some of the ones on the left are maybe a little bit more ambiguous, but I think it's really very strongly Asian. And I think they're just copying the convention. Um, so there you have well, that. This is interesting. So this is 1300. So the black stone has been there since the 1300. Uh, the black stone, as you know, is where it's still there today. And it's in the eastern corner of the Kaaba. And it's where everybody goes to kiss it. Uh, Al-Fadi, who lived just a few, uh, about a 45 minutes from the Kaaba when he was younger there in Jeddah, he and his, his friends would just drive up as a lark in a, on an afternoon, just go up to the Kaaba, park their car, go inside, and they would do the circumambulation and they would always make a beeline for the for the black stone to kiss it because by kissing it they were absolving their sins and uh, uh you know al-fadi remembers doing that as a young man as a young lad it was quite a lark they would do it on on the afternoon now if that is the case even as early as 1307 you have reference you have a depiction of the black stone proving that it's much more much older than people would like to admit more than that if he is the one that is given the authority to put it into the Kaaba. Therefore, it is now sanctified by him himself, which elevates him to a certain position. So, I mean, there's an awful lot of problems here because what's the black stone doing in the Kaaba? Why is it yeah. there? Why don't Muslims want to talk about it? If Muhammad is the one that actually, according to the 1300s, this is the Ottoman period. We're now in the Ottoman period. If this was happening in the Ottoman period, and Muslims need to start talking about that black stone because we're talking about well, we're talking about over 700 years ago, that black stone has been worshipped. The very thing that you're not permitted to do is epitomized by the black stone today. Even today, it's still being worshipped. Right, just go on to the next one. Now, you will notice that these are drawn in an Asian style. Does that mean these leaders were Asian? I don't think so. This is something I mentioned before. I think they didn't want to copy Byzantine style painting, but adopted an alternative painting style that was equally beautiful. But the Chinese themselves kept their art realistic and drew Westerners as Westerners, while Islamic artists simply mimicked the style but didn't keep to the realism. So that's why you have Arabs depicted as Asian. Now, as evidence for that, I got a note from my Chinese sources contact. If you remember back months ago, um, I did um, a series of videos on the Chinese sources. Um, this is very interesting. This is probably the only image of the Dashi, which would be the Taiyai, ambassadors or envoys that can be found in the 7th century Tang China royal tomb mural paintings. According to scholars, there are two sets of mural paintings depicting the ambassadors from foreign countries being received by the prince uh, uh, Zhang Wei at the Tang royal court during the years 675 AD to 680. So this is really interesting. On the eastern side of the mural, Fu Len, which is the East Roman Empire, uh, Jin Lu, uh, Korea, and uh, Ki Dan, uh, which is the Kitan ambassadors, were being guided by the Tang officials. The ambassador of Fu Len was probably a Nestorian or a Christian monk arriving at Tang China by sea route. So this is the the uh, essentially the Umaid representative, and he's a Nestorian. How interesting. Now, the, the reason why I included this, you can see here that here we're not seeing an Asian figure. We're seeing a clearly a Caucasian, a pretty ugly Caucasian, but we're seeing a Caucasian, someone from, uh, I think, am I right in saying Caucasian? Well, so someone who's from the Middle East, what would you call it? An Oriental, could we say that? I would just I say think. Middle Easterner, I think. Middle sure. Eastern. Just yeah. to say Middle so Eastern he, feature because he doesn't look really Caucasian. He does look yeah. more Middle Eastern, uh, but you're yeah. right. It is a very ugly depiction, but he's certainly yeah. not Chinese. And he's certainly a monk. Not so if this yeah. is a monk, this is a problem because <laughs> what is he doing as a monk? You should be a Muslim by the, by, at this period. Yeah. And so this is the time of Mu Muawiyah. So Muawiyah ruled from 661 to 680. This is at the latter period of his rule. 
so even at that stage, he's he's sending out an ambassador who is um, an Nestorian monk, uh, which, yeah, as you probably know, the Nest or our audience will know, the uh, Nestorians existed in Mesopotamia. Yeah. Um, so it's quite interesting that what we have here is the same art form as we've seen in the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th century, but when the Chinese did it, they were they were realistic. So if someone was a Westerner, they drew them as a Westerner, whereas if they are from Korea, they do, they were depicted as Korean and so on. Whereas when that art form was was imitated, everyone became Asian, and I think that's something to bear in mind. Okay, let's let's we all put it together. Mel, go back, Joe. That let's put these two together. We have already seen by from the coins that Muawiya could not have been a Muslim could not have been a Muslim when he was uh, his coins coming out of the East over here. Those coins are also Rastrian. They have the fire altar. They have Kusara the second. They also have him. He also has his images and ones on the West over here, the ones from Syria, those coins are all Christian. He's carrying crosses. He has it above his head. He has it on. So here you have a art piece of art that comes from the same time period that the coins are being minted also showing that his emissary the, that, that represents him, Mu'uya, there in the Chinese court is a Nestorian monk and not a Muslim. So that supports what we see in the, in the, in, uh, in, in the coinage. And you're bringing an artistic uh, depiction that coincides and parallels what the coins are telling us. And you know what's really interesting? If you look really closely um, to the, the monk's neck, you'll see what looks like... Um, a necklace of some kind. I would suggest that probably underneath that is a cross. He's probably carrying a cross underneath there. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it's a possibility. Um, but it's we're not looking at we're not looking at uh, well the dress the same of, head of, the top of, with the hair around, which would be the monks. Uh, that's how the monks did it at that time, and also the frock yeah. with just one belt to show yeah. that uh, to to show uh, that they were not wealthy. That was very much a uh, monks costume and that would not yeah. be a muslim that would not be a muslim get up at all no. yeah so we have another image um from that time and uh, obviously these are two little snapshots which will tell us quite a lot about what was really going on from the time and obviously the, the reason i'm just to re-emphasize the point the reason i'm saying this is because i'm, I'm suggesting that we can't really um, draw too much inference from the fact that muhammad and, and his followers are depicted as asian because it's likely that they're just conventionally drawing everyone in that style rather than it being a, a realistic depiction. But here in China, they were capable of making distinctions in terms of ethnicities because, you know, they, they are much more sophisticated in the way that they've drawn these um, people. Now, if you look at this one, um, on the Western side of the mural, uh, Zhao Chang, uh, which is nowadays Turfan in the Uyghur Autonomous Region, which is the northwestern part of China. Uh, Tufan, which is the Tibetan, and the Dashi, which is Tayaye, and this is the Umaid, were being guided by the Tang officials. And so each of these different groups, as you can see, are labeled in the picture. Scholars suggest these ambassadors were from big, powerful, and important countries. So that is why they were eligible to be summoned by the Crown Prince. Uh, Zhang Wei at that time. Just by looking at how Dashi, the, how the Dashi ambassador is dressed, one can conclude that he was from Mesopotamia region and not likely from the Hejaz. I think that's pretty obvious from the way he's dressed. I don't think you'll ever find someone dressed remotely like that way down in the Hejaz. Okay. Now, so if we look at this in, in closer detail, the Taiyaye ambassador was wearing a Phrygian cap. And this is actually associated, if you look at the map there on the left-hand side, this is associated with uh, what's now called Turkey. Uh, it's right, right in the middle, Phrygia. And uh, it's basically a Byzantine or East Roman style hat. So that's quite interesting that the representative of the Taiyaye is, is, is dressed in a Byzantine style. And it's interesting that hat or that cap uh, during the American and French revolutions, it became known as the Liberty Cap, which is quite ironic considering uh, that the uh, Umaids uh, essentially took away liberty uh, at that time. 
And most recently, it's become famous through a kid's cartoon called The Smurfs, as you can see there on the right hand side. Now, you can see that uh, this figure here, um, he's not Asian. Um, he's got a nose which is uh, quite long. Uh, I don't think you could fairly depict him as Asian. I think you could easily accept him as being, say, so, from somewhere like Iraq or Syria or somewhere like that. Okay. Now, again, it's going back to the artwork from the time, uh, 1307. Again, um, we have more Asian artwork, and this is the, the famous Mirage, the, 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 uh, the night ride of Muhammad on the, Burk, the Burak, which is depicted as a kind of, a, like almost like a centaur, essentially, and the, the face of it is uh, like an Asian woman. And uh, I don't know if you want to comment on any of that. No, I mean, it's fascinating because... <laughs> It's a woman, female Burak. I've never thought of that being a female Burak. Uh, and it looks like in, in, in this case, he is, he, I, I mean, there's the, we've talked about this before. He has all the, all the facial descriptions. And you see, the, if you're looking down on him, pointing, holding down and almost holding on to her, I guess her arms is what he's holding on to keep from, from falling out. But what is she holding in her hand? Is that the Quran? Yeah, it's not clear. <laughs> is this the, uh, the 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 tablet in heaven or something like that? It's it's not not clear, um, and uh, you know there's a lot of mysteries in this picture. But, because um, the the mirage itself is not where he receives the Quran. The mirage is where he receives the the fifty prayers, which he whittles down to five prayers, and yeah. the only reference to it, supposedly the reference to it is in chapter 17, verse 1 of the Quran, which today we pretty well know could not have be, could not be the case because uh, there, was, there was no mosque there. In, uh, in, in, if this happens in 621 is when, most, is when most people place it. If this event happens in 621, there was no mosque in 621 because Jerusalem was not even taken over until 638 too much late. So I'm not, I'm surprised they have the Quran there and I would be, I'd be interested to know why the Quran would be, would be placed in the yeah. Buddha hand. Do you know what? I, I think the thing that strikes me about this is not only do Muslims of the time have no problem with the depiction of Muhammad in an image, but actually these images were central to creating the mythology because, okay, if you're talking about a Burak that flies up into the heavens and so on, you need to help people to visualize it. And one great way of helping people to visualize it is to actually draw pictures. You know, a picture says a thousand words. Um, and so you can imagine for most people, who, a lot of people at that time would have been illiterate. These images would have been highly useful in terms of um, propaganda to promote the religion and to um, increase people's fervor and faith. So rather than this being seen as a negative, um, depictions of Muhammad in images would have been part of the propaganda, part of the, the way that the leaders at that time would have promoted Islam among the ordinary folk. Yeah, you can go one step further, uh, Mel. If you look, if you go to the British Museum, we, <clears throat> we, we did this all the time. Look at the Assyrian uh, uh, murals and the obelisks and the stelas. They are all pictures of battles. And you follow them, and you follow them from right to left, or, in, or from left to right, excuse me. You always follow from left to right. I'm going up to backwards for those who are watching the other direction. You always start at the beginning of the battle, and then you have, uh, you have the enemy in the middle, and then you have the, the, fi the, final, uh, where, the final picture of the throne where then the enemy then capitulates and gives over, and then you have people impaled on stakes. This is like a, it's a comic book, you might say, of the battle. And this was done in all the palaces. And it was done yeah. in the Syrian period. It was done in the Babylonian period. It was done in all the ancient histories because they didn't have comic books like we do today. They didn't have radio. I mean, they didn't have television or TV or cinema like we do today. Well, this is the equivalent. And as we said earlier with the coins, whenever a ruler comes to power, the first thing they do is mint coins so they get their image on it. So the image is there so they can say, I am now the new ruler that gets in the hand of everybody. So the same notion, you have these comic depictions of very important events. The Mirage would have been an important event because that not only elevates Muhammad, but it also gives 
the reference point for why, why is it they now pray five times a day. And of course, in this case, uh, what's a little curious is why the Quran is there. Unless, of course, because it's 1307 at this time, this is then pointing to that reference in chapter 17, verse 1. Absolutely. Now, so we go moving on a few years, 1320 is that picture there that we opened with. So Muhammad is receiving what seems to be a city by an angel. And now there is just some dispute about this city. Some people might have thought, well, it must be Mecca or um, Medina. But last time I looked, there are no rivers running through either of these places. Um, <laughs> Mah- uh, Murad has suggested maybe is it Jerusalem. I don't think there are rivers to justify Jerusalem. So having looked into it a little bit, uh, then the only place I can find that looks remotely like the, the waterways there is Baghdad, which is, uh, that's a modern map of Baghdad. As you can see, the, the contours of the water pretty much line up pretty well. But obviously this is uh, just speculation on my part. Um, beyond this, I've no idea where this might be, but this is my, my best guess uh, in terms of where it is. So um, it is uh, it is what it is. Um, obviously, the Muslims at the time considered this an important statement. And I can't imagine someone being sponsored to make this painting uh, and going through all this effort to make this painting if this was not meant to be seen by lots of people. I think this would have been um, shown and seen by lots of people and no one seemed to be... Um, troubled by this no one went and destroyed this image thankfully um you know it's lasted hundreds of years um that in itself tells a story can i just come back on that i think what muslims would say is let's be careful don't try to uh, unpack the image any more than what it is if i would i would have no problem believing that this is muhammad receiving mecca remember because that's part of the tradition remember uh, at the treaty of hudaybiyah that happens According to the traditions, now remember, this is according to the Siddha, according to the traditions, this happens just the year before he takes it over in 630. So this is 629. In 629, he has his treaty with the Meccans of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, where he would not attack Mecca with the understanding that anybody that wanted to leave Mecca and come up to Medina, they would be able to do so. A year later then, because he kept his word on that, they then offer him Mecca and he just walks in. So I would suggest that's what this is depicting. It's not just that this is man offering. This is now God offering him Mecca. And I would just yeah. leave it at that because you do have the minarets there and you do have yeah. uh, assuming that that is the Kaaba or it could be, I mean, it could be the minarets from Medina, uh, from, from Medina as well. But I'm, su- I'm, su- I'm, suggesting, I'm suggesting that that's all that this is trying to depict. It's probably not actually trying to depict it in any yeah, I would say geographically the, accurate. I think, is, right. I think it is what it's saying. But what is yeah. fascinating is it shows Muhammad quick clearly, and it has no difficulty showing him and receiving Mecca as his. Uh, and then, of course, the image is nothing more than that. It's that he was given it because look at how could you have a huge city given to him on a piece of of stone? It was that he was being offered Mecca so that he could just walk it, which he did according to traditions. He then walked into Mecca in six thirty without firing a shot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, back to, do you remember this story that uh, Ralph of Cain had, had mentioned about um, an idol in the okay. Dome of the Rock? Well, here um, is a picture from 1317 to 1330. Um, it's uh, the Prophet Muhammad sits with the Abrahamic prophets in Jerusalem, anonymous. It's from the Miranama, the Book of Ascension. Now, the, this is basically um, a picture of Muhammad meeting the, um, the prophets when, when he traveled to Jerusalem. Now, it's possible uh, that what, what Ralph of Cain is talking about is maybe that they had placed a statue to depict the same event, the, the event as depicted in the Surah, which is Muhammad meeting the prophets. And so um, what essentially we have here is just two images of the same event being commemorated. One is a painting, which is an image of it. The other possibly is a statue in situ depicting that meeting of Muhammad with the prophets. So I hold that out as a possible explanation. 
um, if if true, um, it would go to support the idea that maybe there is something of, uh, to this idea of an idol in the Dome of the Rock. And this might be the nearest we have to what that idol may have looked like. Uh, if you notice that in this image, the the image of Muhammad is has got purple on him, the same as mentioned here, the purple cloth. So that's uh, that's a suggestion. Now, if you look at the image as well, if you compare the size of it with the people in the foreground, it's clearly not a life-size image of Muhammad. So I think that fits with the idea that this is a statue and not actually a person. And possibly, and again, this is massively speculative on my part, but possibly this image was based on an earlier drawing or painting of the original idol in the Dome of the Rock. Um, and to confirm the idea that this is meant to be in the Dome of the Rock, we can see the the Sacra, that rock that is often depicted in um, photos of the Dome of the Rock. So uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, well, this is fascinating because it's 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 telescoping history and misconstruing history simultaneously, and this is typical of what artists do, and this is artistic freedom they can do this but take a look you got some problems there first of all what in the world is he doing in the dome of the rock which was built in 691 and first and be more than that how could he have ever gone to jerusalem during his lifetime we don't have any reference from going that far yeah uh, to jerusalem so that would be a, a misnomer the dome of the rock that's definitely the dome of the rock because it has the inner ambulatories the pillars from the inner ambulatories that was built in 691 muhammad died in 632 the fact that it has the sacras is just showing that it's depicting on it uh, so it's fascinating that there, this is a, a telescoping of history to make a point. But the fact that he's wearing the the purple again, that shows his royalty. So it shows his ascendancy. And there you have you have the halo. You notice the halo around his head showing again that he is divine. Uh, uh, no one else has that halo but him. So all of this put, put into there is poetic license, or in this case, artistic license. But it's making a point. And maybe if it is... You're right. I, I would suggest that you probably are getting to something here. If there had been a statue that this is depicting, and that statue had had been placed in the Dome of the Rock in the 10th and 11th century, finally destroyed in 1118, then or 1111, sorry, then that would this would be something that's reminiscing back to that period. But obviously, yeah. if it's just a statue, then that would make sense. If it is actually Muhammad preaching to the Abrahamic prophets, then of course, this is the, this is more than, this is much more ethereal in this reference. I don't know if you look carefully, but you can still, you can start to see some different races there as well in this painting. Yeah, you can. Yeah. And the other little detail that I point out is the fact that the angel is offering two bowls. And this relates to the, the Syrah, which talks about being offering, uh, I think is wine and milk and he chooses milk. Uh, so this is another little detail. So it's it is trying to link it in with the Sirah and the story of Muhammad meeting the um, the prophets. But as you can see, it looks very much like it could be a statue that it's actually based on. Now, so if we go on from there, uh, we have uh, another example of Muhammad. This this is Muhammad being born, and he's again. There's a flame coming out of his head, a bit like a halo. And uh, you have, um, what else? Um, it's kind of, it's, it's almost like a parallel to the nativity of Jesus because um, you have the angels visiting the, the baby Muhammad. So it's very similar. Um, so that's the 15th century, uh, 1430. And this is just on the eve of the banning of the image of Muhammad's face, as we'll see shortly. Now, 1436, another image of Muhammad. Um, not going to say much on that one. Um, here's another one, uh, 1436 to 1437. Another Burak. Burak was very common. Here we have the Huri are showing themselves as well. Um, so below Muhammad, uh, riding camels are some of the fabled Huri of paradise. Um, and this is from the 15th century Persian manuscript entitled Miraj Nama. Now, what's interesting? Yeah. 
if you look at that, there's the female Budok again. So it's a female um, woman. And notice yeah. instead of a halo, now they have a fire that yeah. depicts him almost like a spiritual, holy uh, per a person. So they've changed it from the round halo now into a fire that envelops him. Yeah. Um, actually, I think in the, uh, and, and Lloyd will probably go into this with you, but I think there are references in the Sirah to the idea that Muhammad was the light from which all other great prophets were were made from, which is very, very akin to saying he's a god as such. Um, it's it's a kind of di divinizing him, a turning him into a, a deity. But in any case, um, we have this other one again depicting Muhammad next to the angel Gabriel with giant size uh, angels uh, next to him. And then we have this one, which is of unknown date, but probably around the same period. Again, we see a clear image of that flame. And he's obviously not just being depicted as a human there. I think he's being depicted in, in divine form. And then we have the new development. Muhammad's face becomes finally veiled from around 1500 AD. So this is you know, well into the Ottoman period. In Ottoman areas, images began to veil Muhammad's face, or in some cases replaced by golden flames. His face was not obscured in every depiction, though, and while the tradition of depicting him in human form waned, it ne never died. So it's a kind of essentially there was a fork in the road. Some people started veiling him, and some people continued to depict his face. Here's the uh, one example. You can see that uh, there's a veil over his face there. This is from 1540. And, and this method became popular with the rise of Sufism. Okay. Now, so you can see how it's gone from what we have there on the left to what we have there on the right. So why in the 16th century did this transition happen? And so I'm going to give my thoughts on this and perhaps... You can um, opine on this one as well, Jay. Um, one suggestion might be, was the veiling of Muhammad a borrowing from the Hindu practice of veiling in the wedding room? Could it be due to a greater Central Asian influence, perhaps? Or was Muhammad becoming so deified in some circles that showing his face seemed blasphemous? So those are two possible reasons. But that's not the full reason either. Um, so to explain what I think might be the reason, um, in the Byzantine West, what is an icon? An icon was a window intended to reveal, a window into the unseen, a window into heaven. True Christianity is about revealing, not hiding. Hence why Gnosticism was condemned from day one. Uh, an icon is all of these. So if you look at the, some of the words, you know, an icon is about the overt, the visible, the known, etc. Whereas the opposite of that is the occult. What does to occult mean? It means to cut off from view by interposing something. So the reason for the veiling of Muhammad is that Islam had grown ever more consciously Gnostic over time. It is a religion in opposition to Christianity with an antichrist, an anti-gospel, which is the Quran, and even an anti-icon. So this is my explanation for why they moved towards this failing. Sufism is very much a Gnostic um, sect. And so I would suggest that the real reason, it may not be the surface reason, is that it's, it's a Gnostic idea to, to veil because only the, the, um, the elite, only the, the, um, the true Gnostics knew the, the full picture. And so therefore certain things are veiled from view. And uh, as, again, as, as I mentioned before, Lloyd has, has gone into this in great detail, looking at the Sirahs and the Sharia. And he, he would suggest that Gnosticism is very explicit in these uh, sources. I don't know if you want to jump in on that. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I, can't, I can't say either one or the other. What we do, what is most important to me is that this does yet introduced in the 16th century, 1500s, which will help us then to place and date when the Sira, and sorry, when the Hadith were probably written. Yes, yeah, now, that's, very, that's very much important. We have one volume from the 11th century, 
and we need to do more study to find out if that volume has anything about iconoclasm. But the other eight, the most vast majority, are then introduced in the 1500s. Does that mean that there were others that came, like what Lloyd's finding with the Siddha? There are 56 different Siddhas that he has found. Could we not say that the same thing probably exists with the Hadith, that there were many renditions of the Hadith? And with each new rendition, as new theology got introduced, they have to backstory what the prophet said. And so you backstory and redact it back to him saying this. In this case, the fact that the paintings show that this is something as late as 1500, where they, they, where they start veiling him, suggests to me that, uh, that almost everything we know about Muhammad, we can now possibly put to that century and later. So 1500s and later, let's hold on to that. Let's, we can't say it. We're just putting this out as a green paper. This is a green Absolutely. paper. But let's see if this, if, if, this is, if, if this is the right. As to why they started veiling him, I'm not, I, don't, I can't say here or no or, or other whether or not this is a Gnostic belief. What it is, it is important it is that they want to shut down any idea of deifying him and therefore not worshiping him, and then giving him a special status above the other. You can see, even in this picture, he still has the, the halo of, around him. So he is already still being seen as separate, different, and superior. So that is still coming into play. But I think also, just as you may not see God, remember, that's something that we have in Christianity. God, you cannot see yeah. face. Could they be borrowing yeah. that idea? That God yeah. cannot be seen face to face, therefore Muhammad. Cannot, whose face cannot be seen as well. They're borrowing yeah. that idea because we have elevated God to such an extent that not even Moses was permitted to see God face to face yeah. and be put in the cleft of the rock. Or they say, ah, well, we want that for Muhammad. That would then elevate him to a status, not really divine, but we, uh, we would suggest it is divine because they don't realize what they're doing. They're actually deifying him in the process. And I think that's probably maybe, that's what I would yeah. Probably going yeah, on. yeah. Actually, I think there's kind of a contradiction even in this image because on one ha one hand they're kind of deifying him, and on the other they're saying don't don't make him an idol. So it's kind of like they haven't fully worked out. Seems like they haven't fully worked out what exactly their attitude towards Muhammad is. Um, or but, is um, this mainly just reverence? So much reverence for him that we dare not show his face. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, Bringing us up to the 20th century, then we can still see images of Muhammad. This is Muhammad's flight from Mecca in 622 AD. Uh, this is an Algerian color postcard from the 1920s or 30s. So I, I, I find this incredible. Um, there's images of Muhammad, but it's on a postcard. So people were clearly very comfortable with having postcards with Muhammad's image, sending it through the postal system, knowing where, you know, the way postcards are thrown into a bag and so on. This, this is not like having an image of Muhammad and reverently having it on a, a mantelpiece. This is going through the postal system. It shows a very different um, idea of um, Muslim sentiment in the early 20th century than perhaps you might find today. Would this, though, represent the powers that be, or is this nothing more for tourists? It's a good question, well, but, I, but I would say that it's... Um, if, if Muslims were unhappy with this and these were on sale in Algeria, I'd imagine they would have kicked up a fuss if they were unhappy with it, but it doesn't seem to have. Um, and um, no one seemed to have any problems with it back then. Uh, so it's interesting. It, I think it shows that there was certainly a tradition going back the centuries, as we've seen, where images of Muhammad were there and people didn't have a problem with it and didn't see um, why they should be banned. And they would have actually seen this in a positive way, that it was uh, a way of remembering Muhammad. And it was all done respectfully. It wasn't done in a disrespectful way. Um, so here's another one. This is from the 1990s. Ironically, it was created from a photo taken by an Arab boy, by an Orientalist uh, um, in the early part of, I think it was the early part of the 20th century. And if we look at 2006, here we're back to the veiling. Prophet Muhammad receives revelations on Mount Hira. In, this is in a children's book. Um, and then if we jump to this one, 2008, on a five-story building, there's a mural depicting Muhammad's celestial ascension in Tehran. And his face is, um, is veiled, but the rest of him is in full sight. Um, so as you can see, there's kind of, it's still a mixed bag. 
we see kind of both traditions going on simultaneously. And then 2015, we have a still from the film Muhammad, the Messenger of God. The young Muhammad enters a monastery where he is recognized as a prophet. And as you can see, they have uh, veiled his image. So in conclusion, it would appear that Islam, at least in one tradition, has evolved towards banning depictions of Muhammad beginning in Ottoman times, which was a compromised solution to veil his face. This has evolved into more radical traditions that ban images of him in any shape or form, regardless of the pious intentions behind such depictions. On the other hand, some Muslims remain tied to, to traditions that are verifiably over 1,000 years old of depicting Muhammad in art, including his face. It is a mistake to think that this was solely a Turkish or Shia practice. Grober points out that at certain periods, Iran and the Ottoman lands had Sunni rulers, and some of those illustrations were sponsored by vehemently Sunni patrons. The patrons were very clear that when they produced the images of the Prophet, they are continuing the tradition of the Prophet, she says. Listen, Mel, thanks so much. This has been fun. It's been great following through the pictures. You're bringing up a, a completely new genre. This is a new genre that uh, we're going to have to give you credit for. You're the first that's really unpacked it for us. You are just putting this out there as possibilities. What I think is fascinating is the pictures you've shown in this episode and the one you did in the last episode. There is an evolution in this theology. There is an evolution in this thought of depicting Muhammad or not depicting Muhammad. The earliest ones, you showed the palaces in the last episode, they're in Syria and in Jordan and in Jericho. No problem depicting anybody. In fact, depicting topless women bathing, men leering at her. Uh, you can show also in this episode all the, the, the pictures of Muhammad from the very beginning. And you can see him. He's there giving his, you know, he's there giving his last sermon. It was fascinating that you also zeroed in on the statue itself, the statue of Muhammad that that uh, that Khan, Ralph of Khan, who is uh, rewriting of this in the 11th, uh, 1100s, he was writing about what the Crusaders had done earlier in the 11th century, 1000s, and that they had gone to Jerusalem in the first of the Crusades, and they had seen the statue, and they depicted it as so heavy they couldn't even lift it. 11 men could not even lift it and that he was wearing a robe made of purple, which is royalty. And then you came back and you rounded back, said, could this be that image in another painting that, that was for much later, from the 1300s, could this be that painting that, that Khan is referring to? Could well be, which suggests that if he's a statue right there on the Dome of the Rock of all places, the center of, at that time, the center uh, certainly when it was built in 691, uh, what, as Abdul Malik wanted to build it, then that would be hugely significant because it's sitting right over the Temple Mount, right, which is the Holy of Holy for the Jews. Possibly, uh, if that was there, then that was, again, a mockery against the Jews and a mockery against the Christians who pilgrimed, whose pilgrims still went to the Church of the Sepulcher down, further down in the valley. But what's interesting is you then went and showed that the progression of Muhammad Continued. There was lots of depictions of him. There was no difficulty depicting him until, until the 1500s, the 16th century. And then it changes. The 1500s, 16th century, it changes. Now, as we have always asked, and also I've asked you to do and all the other people, follow the evidence on the ground. And you've done this. In this case, you're doing it with pictures. If that is the case, if the evidence seems to show very clearly that this problem with iconoclasm, this problem with images does not really get introduced until the 1500s, until the 16th century, then all these references in the traditions, that the, the Hadith especially, that we have always attributed to the 9th and 10th century, actually probably are not written in the 9th and 10th century, that these are more than likely written in the 15th, 1600s, which is the 16th and 17th century, redacted back to the 9th and 10th century, which is redacting it back to the 7th century. And what you're seeing by looking at the images, there's a disconnect in the standard Islamic narrative again. Phew, this is a disconnect. And the disconnect is they've got the wrong man doing the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong places. He has, he is perfectly well depicted all the way up to the 1500s in almost all the imagery we can see. 
He is given a halo. He is given fire to show that he starts to become divine. Once he starts becoming divine, then they've got to cover his face. What is it a Gnostic reason? I would no, my my guess is no. This is showing a respect for him. Just as God cannot be seen face to face, Muhammad must not be seeing his face to give him a, a sort of reverence. So they're making, they're almost elevating him to divinity. And uh, this elevation of divinity, you and I have noticed this. And in fact, we have said this over and over again. Why is it whenever people talk about Moses, they don't say anything or talk about Jesus, they don't say anything. But whenever they mention the name Muhammad, praise be unto him. Praise be unto him. Remember when they did cartoons against Jesus? Well, listen, Charlie Hebdo had terrible cartoons against Jesus. Enormously horrendous cartoons against Jesus. And as soon as they had a cartoon against Muhammad, in 2015, all the editors had to be shot and killed. And this was uh, all over the world. Remember those cartoons of Muhammad that came out in Denmark? Jill Poland's part cartoon. And all over the world, there were riots and 17 people lost their lives because of those cartoons. And I remember going to the Trafalgar Square after that, and he had, they had a huge rally. And I saw tens of thousands of Muslims all there de remonstrating, how dare you depict Muhammad this way? How dare you have mockery? How dare you show his image? And I remember just talking to different people. And I said, what in the world are you going? What's happening here? Why are, have you done? What's your problem with showing Muhammad's image? And they turn to me and say, Mr. Smith, Muhammad is closer to me than my own father. Muhammad is closer to me than my own brother, than my own husband. And I was sitting there saying, hold on a minute. You can see your husband. You can see your father. You can see your, you can see your son. You've never seen Muhammad. In fact, you don't even have any images of him anymore. And when there is an image, you go all berserk and you start killing everybody. And I remember the penny dropped at that time to me. I remember penny dropped at that time when I was there at that big rally at Trafalgar Square in central London, I realize that they want what we have. We have what they want. We know Jesus face to face. We know that Jesus did, was God. Jesus did enter time and space. He did so at the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, walking and talking with Adam and Eve. He did their wrestling with Jacob. He did their coming not just as a human. He came as a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire during the night as he led the children of Israel through the desert. He came as a burning bush. And listen, the Muslims have that even in the Quran, in chapter 21 and in chapter 27 of the Quran. There is the burning bush. That's God. He is a burning eternal fire that doesn't go out. God can enter time and space and come our level anytime he wants, and he can take on human form, and he can see us. We can see him face to face. Listen, the disciples were with him for three years. John and Matthew wrote about it. Mark and Luke talked about it. They wrote what the others, the eyewitness had seen. So we know that God can be seen face to face. Islam doesn't. They cannot. They don't have any image of God. They've never seen him face. They don't know what it's like to have a relationship with God. And here they're hearing us talk about all, look at all our worship that we have. How many times do we talk about how we love Jesus, how he comes and he walks with us and talks with us and he builds us up and everything else. We look to Jesus and they want what we have. So what do they do? What do they do? Well, they start making images of him. And the images they have were quite normal, were quite normal. And they always depict him of him going up to the seven heavens, the mirage, pictures of him having his last sermon, pictures of him putting the black rock into the Kaaba of all things. The very thing that you must not do is what he is doing. And then in the 1500s, they realized, hold on a minute. This is my take on it. In the 1500s, they realized, no, 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 no. You can't see God face to face. He is to be so holy. They have deified him to such an extent now. They have elevated him to so high. They have given him the royal robes, the royal colors of royalty. They have now have halos around his head. And now they turn into fire. He becomes the illumined. As, as your friend Lloyd is saying, he becomes the light to all of people. And almost he has now taken on the form of God. If he is God, if he is deified, you must not show his face. This is my take on it. I think what they're doing is they have such a reverence because they need God, face to face. They need someone that support, that has, that does what we already have. We already have that. Jesus has, is God. He did come to us face to face. He did live for 33 years. He did die and rise on the cross. Wherefore, we have no problem depicting him. If only Muslims can realize that, why don't they come on home?
They're wasting their time on Muhammad. They're wasting their time on this Al-Qaeda classroom. They're wasting this time and trying to create a theology that keeps them at arm's length and makes him, keeps them above them and keeps them so holy that we can't even show his face. When they can come back and see Jesus face to face, we've got him. They need him. Come on home. Great talk. I love what you've done here. This is so good because you've asked, you've done what we've asked you to do. You have shown the sequence. You have shown the evolution by looking at the pictures. There's going to be a lot more that we're going to have to do on this. We're going to have to do a lot more study to see exactly why is it that they finally did veil his face. Your view is that it's because of Gnostic beliefs. My view is that I think it's because of his, their reverence for him. They needed to deify him. And that's the best way to deify him is to make sure he has no face because he cannot be like us. He must yeah. be faceless. We are human. Yeah. He must be of above that human yeah. stature. Well, I would say that I would ahead. say that I agree with you with the deification as well. I think it's a combination of reasons, but I would say it's it's that it's the Gnostic idea and possibly other reasons as well. But it became a, a really strong theological push to veil him at that stage. But it happens in the 1500s, not at the time, Muhammad, not at the time of Abdel Malik in 691, and certainly not at the time that the Hadith were being written. Much, 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 much later. Well, well done. This has been fun. Listen, those of you, there are going to be lots of comments. This has gone on over an hour. It's a long segment. We didn't plan time to do it that much, but there was so much in those pictures we had to talk about it. And Mel, you've done a terrific job. Thank God. And thank you for what you have done. And listen, those of you who do want to comment, come back to us on it. I'm sure some of you have probably looked at these images before. You may know something we don't know. This is the first time we've really introduced it. Mel, this is the first time that he is now. He wants to have it. A reference point. Help us to unpack this. It, is Mel, Mel right? Is there a sequence? Have we an evolution in the whole theology that's been depicted in these pictures? Let us know right in the comments at the bottom here. And we will certainly come back. Mel and I will come back with, with trying to respond to your questions as we see them, if they are good questions. God bless you, Mel. Thank you so much for coming on board. Mel in Ireland, Jay here in the United States. Over and out. Mm -hmm.